Greetings, everybody, and yep. uh, welcome to our second tech tutorial of the day. Uh, we have the topic Snowflake. Sorry, Snowflake Architecture Deep Dive by Mr. Josip Saban, and I hope you'll enjoy the tutorial. Mr. Saban, you can take the word. Thank you. So, sorry. Um, it's in English. I'm. I see the attendee list. So attendee list is quite local. Let me share the screen. Yeah. So, um, hello everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, we have to do it in English, but whoever wants to ask something in Croatian, please interrupt. Um, this will last for two hours. So it's a long time. I will make breaks. I also need to. Um, take a drink of water or something uh and if you finish earlier we finish earlier um i think i have now 12 attendees where we have one uh fireflies note taker so 11 11 people and i hope you will like it so this is the second time i'm doing this and it's it's intended to be uh, um, a little bit more complex so I will keep this one on the other screen. If you will have any questions, just type them or raise the hand. Uh, I will see it, but I'm sharing the main screen. But again, if you will have any any topics, any questions, if you want anything, just, just raise a hand. I will see it on the other monitor. Um, so did anybody do anything with Snowflake? Uh, I'm you... sorry to interrupt, but we cannot see the screen right now. I'm sharing the screen. Wait, give me a second. Is it now visible? Yes, it is. Okay, sorry, guys. So, again, then, sorry, I thought that it was doing it. So, if you if you say anything, I will I will probably see a raised hand at some moment. Uh, I have 15 people plus one person virtual or a note taker um it's in english but if you are, want to ask a question in creation i see that most of us are, are local please do um and i will put it on the other monitor good so snowflake did anybody do anything with snowflake ever at least open the tile account or or or, or something like this um I'm just trying to to get a, 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 a let's say experience level of the group. So, I'm I'm going with an estimate that nobody did it. But if you have any experiences where, where you implemented or, or or did something, it would be quite nice. Um, because maybe you can challenge me, or maybe you can share your experiences or something. Um, so. Zoom doesn't like my camera at the moment for some reason, so I will reconnect it and then hopefully uh, it will it will come back. Um, so what is the idea of the today? Today we have two hours. I plan to make at least one break because I need to stop at some moment. And um, please ask questions. Uh, we have a lot of time. I prepared a lot of material. So we have 65 slides. This is why we have two hours. And I will really try to show you as much as I can about Snowflake. So how did I start with Snowflake? And why did I even do this lecture? I started with Snowflake when it, when it came to the market. It was like three or four years, five years, whatever it is now. And I started working on it on a project where it was Ah, go to hell. Um, I need to activate later. Uh, when 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 it came to the market in the sense that it was still not publicly available. And it grew immensely in the last couple of years. And I'm now on my second very big implementation. And I wanted to show the architecture, meaning how it works below the hood. I cannot show you things which are not yet publicly available, although I have access, but 
I cannot, but I will show you what the platform holds when you start today and what you can do with it. I'm in no way connected to Snowflake as a company. I just use the tool and I, I use it a lot, but, and I like it. So uh, uh, I'm not trying to market it and this is not a marketing lecture. This is hands-on as much as I can to show you how it works in uh, uh, below the surface. Um, again, if there will be any questions, I will look from time to time here. Why are we here? So first of all, a lot of people never did a data warehouse as a service. They did Oracle, they did SQL Server, they did Postgre, they did this and that, but they didn't do it as a specific service. And there is a quite different way of how you model and how you design things when it's cloud only. Then we will discuss the architecture part. This is the name of the lecture where I will go a little bit deeper. Uh, then I will show you the things you can do only on cloud or you can do it also on site, but with much greater effort. So specific features, which are not only Snowflake unique, you have them also in Databricks, you have them in other cloud platforms, but Snowflake is cloud only database. There is no local implementation. We will do some assumptions. First of all, I will not teach you SQL here. I will not teach you what are tables, views, schemas. This is not this kind of lecture. This I expect you know. You did at least once in your life, one BI project end to end. So I don't need to explain you the concept of data quality. I don't need to explain you the concept of, I don't know, governance or, or lineage or loading data or transforming data. So again, this is not a BI lecture. This is an expectation that you know. And my goal is that at the end of these two hours, you can answer for yourself, why should I try Snowflake? Not use it, maybe you hate it, but why should I try Snowflake? Um, if you leave and say, look, this was cool. And now I have 22 attendees and at least 10 of you say this was cool. I want to try it. Then my goal is done. So what we will do, I will first do an inter. I want to get everybody more or less on the same page about the knowledge, about the assumptions, about the architecture. Then. I will go a little bit deeper. Most people just jump in the GUI, go to AWS, Azure, log in and start coding. I don't want to do it like this. I will bother you for at least three to four slides on the architecture, how it works under the hood. And then we will discuss a lot of best practices, how you should do things, how you should optimally use the cloud because Coding and designing on the cloud is not the same as designing on premise. Then I have two hours, which sounds huge amount of time, but actually it's not. So I selected some topics, which are cool features, which come with, with, with Snowflake, but that's not everything. And I think that at the end of the two hours, you will anyway be too too bored to, to listen to more. And my video is still not detected, so no face scan. And then we discuss. So at any moment, please um, chat, uh, question, whatever, raise hand. I have you on the second screen. So if somebody raises a hand, I will stop. Uh, now 20, 23 people, very nice uh, list. And then let's start. So again, for those who joined a little bit later, I'm taking the assumption that you already did something and that you never did Snowflake. If you want to try it in the background, and if you are on a laptop, you can go to um, trial, which is basically sign up snowflake.com and open a trial account. I opened myself a fake email 
just for the sense of this lecture, I used Gmail, I opened something which is uh, fake, right? And I opened myself an account. So if you want, there's like three things you have to click and then you get it. If you want to follow later when we start working, maybe you open yourself an account. And when you log in, this is the first page you will get and I stopped. So this is a fake account, which this is what you will get. And then we will go to the options. But until we reach that stage, so again, if you want sign up.snowflake.com, open a fake account somewhere and just open a 30 day trial. I will start with the introduction. So first of all, it's a long lecture. It's two hours. I will make one break because I also need to yeah, bring something. Um, maybe five minutes one between the main blocks. Um, I cannot interrupt at any moment, but for, if you want to chat, just put to chat whatever question you have and we can answer as soon as possible. Uh, my email, my LinkedIn, this PowerPoint will be available. Um, yeah, main hotel means nothing at the moment, but this is from last time. And if you have a second monitor, it would be nice, then you can, you know, code, but if not, we just go to the slides. Um, so what is Snowflake? Snowflake started as a project. You know, if, if you know anything about big data, it will always start from something like Databricks, which is built on top of Spark or something. Snowflake started more or less from scratch. And it started as cloud only. There is no on-premise way. You can, of course, put your own private cloud, but it has to be Amazon, Azure, or Google Cloud. And they support only these three platforms. You can load normal tables, or you can use Parquet, JSON, CSV, whatever. In TA, you can put operational systems on top of it, but it's not made for it. So now the Snowflake is trying to also catch this market and now trying to, you know, let, let's do also uh, operational data warehouse, uh, operational database, but that's not the idea. The idea is that this is an online data warehouse and on top of it, data science, and we will go into the specific topics. If you don't want to use it as a data science platform, you can use Databricks on top of Snowflake if you like it more. But Snowflake in its nature is an online data warehouse. Again, there is no on-premise. Um, if you want to know how much it costs, and everybody always asks how much it costs, you go to the link below and you will find a pricing page. And on the pricing page, you can put in your email. Again, you can put a fake email and you will get a very nice PDF explaining you how much things cost. But I will show you during the lecture a much better way than just a either marketing PDF. You can, you can do the views and calculate your own expenses for yourself. So, how did it start? And now we are going a little bit to architecture. And the reason why I'm going a little bit theoretical is just to get everybody, because this is an architecture level uh, uh, lecture. I'm going a little bit more into the back, into how things work. In the old days, when you have Oracle SQL Server, whatever, you have something like this. You had a network communication, disk was somewhere stored, it was called a data center, which still exists, of course, and you had a cluster. And this is how you are used to build things. So I'm putting a little bit of TA here, and this is why you get the PowerPoint. And if you want to read more, and I put a lot of links if you want to read more, I will not do it now, of course. And this is how we built systems before. We had a disk architecture, we had disk storages, and the biggest problem is you add things, and then you had to buy new hardware or something. 
and of course you had locking and stuff. So this is how we designed, let's say, when I started in this world. And the second option was shared nothing. You connected and you had an entire server. It had CPU, it had memory, it had disk. And you were connecting to a web address which had an IP or not. Or if it was a cluster, you would connect to a cluster IP or a cluster name or however. How did you extend? Well, you went to your favorite provider and bought more hardware. You plugged it in and you added a machine to the cluster. Both of these concepts, so again, you have a separation of CPUs versus disk, or you have servers. Both of these concepts work well when you are on premise. Scaling here becomes a problem. And now let's 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 say move ourselves from the world of corporates. Let's say that you do something for a huge global company which is doing marketing. And they tell you tomorrow, uh, yeah, well, now we want to do, I don't know, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. And your volume will increase for terabytes over a week. What you, you have a huge problem here. You have a hardware blocking. And this is where Snowflake jumped in. On-premise systems, which acquire a purchase of hardware, were no longer acceptable on, pro on projects which were budgeted. So if I need two to three weeks and for specialized hardware, especially in Corona times, even more, and I want to buy for 50,000, 100,000, the money is not a problem kind of budget, but I could not get five new servers. And this is where Snowflake became popular. And this is a little bit of an overview. You can read about it. This is just like how it was then, right? And then Snowflake and partially Databricks, if you come from this world, designed a different architecture approach. They completely separated the layers. They separated the layers of storage, the layer of compute, and the layer of cloud. And although this looks a trivial change, it's actually a crucial change if you want to scale, if you want to get more resources and you are ready to pay for them. And let's say, what would be the biggest cost here? Of course, the biggest cost is compute, like in every cloud, but availability was let's click a mouse. And in five minutes, I could get 25 more processors. My end users would not know it, and I would just pay for it. Now, just paying for it is a problem if you don't optimize your cost. And this is why we will discuss a lot about cost, because cost can blow up. So let's start discussing what we have here. Snowflake for marketing purposes calls it a hybrid approach, and there is a fancy name for it. I will not go in the fancy naming. But the key factor is that now compute and storage are completely separated. For instance, you want to add a new data source. You want to add, I don't know, Instagram, Instagram API, right? And maybe you don't need a lot of compute, but you now need one more terabyte per day a week. This is the scope of the things we are talking about. So let's add some storage. And we can separate on storage, compute, and cloud. Now, I think that everybody who wanted to connect, connected. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this architecture inter is to get everybody on the same page. And I know that some of you maybe know it, but bear with me. I just want everybody to be on the, on the same level before we really start going into Snowflake. And storage, compute, and cloud can scale independently. So if you need more hardware, you, you put a slider on the web page. But be aware, it costs money. 
And cloud services are a service layer. So let's say that you want to now add packet files, which you never did. Maybe if the cloud service provides it, you will have out of the box implementation, or you will write your own in, I don't know, Python or whatever. And you don't need to use a cloud service and you don't need to pay for the cloud service. So it's already really, really flexible. They're both self-scaling and they're both charged separately. So when you pay a bill, there is a cloud compute and storage separation. Of course, compute is 90 something percent of cost, but you can really detail see on what you are spending your money. So now let's get let's get deeper in the snowflake. What do we have on the storage? And if you do any cloud tomorrow, this will probably be almost the same. Um, if you remember the old world, when you store data, it was uncompressed. Each big database always had a feature like Oracle or SQL, which uh, uh, had a feature. Now we, we can compress. And the second thing we always did, if you come from a little bit older world, would be partitioning. There was a huge art of how will you do partitions versus compression. And then you would have primary keys, and then we would have foreign keys, and then you would build indexes. And there was an entire Bible how to write properly indexes. This doesn't exist anymore. It's done, but you don't see it. So all these big data stuff have automated partitions, which they do by analyzing the data you are loading. You can give him hints, but he can ignore the hints. And it works really well. And I'm now doing the loads of between 200 and 300 million per day. And micro partitions, how Snowflake does it, he creates tens of thousands of them but it's all done in the background. You don't see it. It's a shared disk, so you don't see it. You just add or remove more disks and you pay for the average usage. So this is, if you're doing big systems, quite important. It's not on the peak, it's on average. Because sometimes you have to load a lot of data inside which you delete because it's temporary. You do aggregations and maybe you don't need to keep history. So the money is average per month. In the storage layer, in the background, it's a blob storage. Depending on the cloud platform you will use and it's independent. And you can, in the configuration, scale read and write operations. How it's done, how partitioning is done, you can read in the documentation I will show, but it's invisible. You, you don't, you actually don't see it. It just happens. You can, there are system views which can show you how, what is done, but you cannot, there is no partition by clause. It doesn't exist. And it's automatically compressed, which again, you don't see, but it's automatically compressed because of the blob. Now, depending on which cloud you are using, it's the different kind of blob, but about this. Uh, storage layer, again, if you want to read a little bit about it, I will not, again, you get these slides. Um, but they eat about it. I put a lot of info, which I will not go to on the lecture, but there is info here. So compute. Compute is handled by something which is called a virtual warehouse. Virtual warehouse is a layer, is a virtual entity, which I will show in the, in the uh, GUI where you define how much compute you want. So you let's say you want to do a virtual warehouse, which is called test. You create a virtual warehouse, which is called test, and then assign it, I don't know, 
instance of medium, this many processors, this many disks, you assign it hardware. And your users of the database use a virtual warehouse. So it's a, it's a placeholder where you define hardware used. And then based on the roles in the system, which your users are assigned to, they can use the virtual warehouse. So it's, and this is done by the admin or let's say a person with a high privileged role. So a normal user connected cannot spend money if he's not assigned the privilege that he can actually change the hardware. He's just assigned a medium instance and he cannot do anything about it. And on one instance, you can have 10, 20, 30 virtual warehouses, which means that your analyst might get a medium one because he needs a lot of joints, but your data engineer, which is just loading the data, but not doing transformations, might get a small one, because if the load takes 10 minutes instead of five, you will not pay the double money. He will wait 10 minutes, or the job will execute 10 minutes, and who cares, it's anywhere done in the night. So the, 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 the game of cost optimization is quite important here. Um, sorry. Um, how, it, how it works below the surface, each virtual warehouse is actually a virtual machine. Again, as an end user, you don't see this. And they're basically using whatever, whatever is available in that cloud environment. And they are on the standby. So for instance, you put on a virtual warehouse, which is for analysts, but it's night. So your people are not working. It goes down. And it's not charging the money. You can define an activity timeout, which is five or 10 minutes. And if there is no activity, it shuts down and doesn't charge you money for it. But when the first user connects, there is a slight delay of, let's say, 10, 15 seconds on the startup because the virtual machine needs to boot up in the background. But then it works normally. So the system takes care that if you put up an Excel instance, which is costing you 10 times more than the small instance, and there are no queries on it, it will not charge you the money. And if you, do, if you did some database story, you, you, you remember how it handles the, 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 the ACID part. Here, each data warehouse process, uh, virtual warehouse processes a request but even if you have multiple virtual warehouses running on the database level, they will keep the integrity. And again, you don't see this. So even if you have separated working environments, the database itself, the engine itself, the cloud services, which is part is transaction manager, will take care of asset. And the last but not the least, the cloud layer, and this is what you see. This is your GUI. This is your web application. This is where you write your queries. This is your admin tool. This is where you work. Here is the, where you define security. Here you have access to views for metadata. Here you define roles. Here you optimize things. You create reports and so on and so on. And one very important thing, it handles logins. And logins is much more than it seems. Here you can have also the, 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 all the modern things, you know, uh, two-factor authentication, even three-factor authentication. Uh, all of this we will go to on the security uh, slides. What he also does is using the metadata, which is basically those micropartitions and compression we discussed, among other things to optimize the queries. So the query optimizer is also here. It's called an optimizer, I would say. It's stateless. So the cloud services you don't pay directly. And the cost of using the services is less than 1% of the total cost. It's there, but if you will see a report and I can show you how they look, this is less than 1%. So the more or less the message, if the service here is provided, except the system ones, use it because this you will not pay a lot. Um, 
one important part of this layer is the metadata one. Everything about Snowflake is kept in the metadata from the writing of code. And I'm not talking about the simple stuff like just query plans or query execution or whatever we did before. It's also the data about data. For instance, to, to create micro partitions automatically, he needs to keep a, lot, a, a large number of statistical stuff about the data itself. Because otherwise, how would he know how to create micro partitions? Or uh, uh, you can even you can use which users are doing. So there's a lot of things which are held in this metadata layer. And again, I will not bother you with, with all the details, but I will give you the information of where you can aid. And this is why I said two hours is not enough. And I will constantly mention I will give you info to aid because it's yeah, this is a huge platform. But my goal here is to give you an overview. And if you have specific questions, please, please raise a hand. So how does it work? What is the life cycle of a Snowflake query? <clears throat> you have a web UI, which you will get access to if you open a test account, or you can use a lot of tools to connect either ODBC, JDBC, and you have a Snow SQL, which is a command line interface if you want to do it from Visual Studio or something. And here, except when you use the service, and one of the services is, of course, the SQL editor, which is also a service, you define which virtual warehouse which have, will have which instance. And this is my last architecture slide, so don't worry, you're almost one of the last. I will not bother you too much. I just want to show you how a query is processed. And it's a little bit different than using the traditional databases. So when a query is issued, you write select star from something, or don't write star, hopefully. The cloud service layer does the parsing, compiling, and from that metadata thing, which you remember, which is here, immediately knows which micro partitions are holding the data, which means you no longer have to do, if you remember, you know, you have to do a where statement, and then you have to go to query analyzer and hope that it will do an index seek, right? This is done now automatically because in the metadata, he knows which data is inside. I'm telling you this specifically because it it really makes the development much easier and performance much higher. Um, you can scale up and down. If you give your, 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 your users the ability to change instances, they can go from small, extra small with a click of a mouse. And you can filter, not just on multiple factor authentication, but also on incoming IP. And when you want, to use Snowflake in a corporate environment, these security concepts come because of governance. So let's say that you are authenticated, then the old fashioned way, logical plan, query plan, optimized query plan, but then it starts the cluster. So since this is a serverless thing, it needs to choose which cluster to start. And you can define on the level of code, so use something, or the default one. So it's always quite smart to start putting extra small as default. So if you forget, it will not start. And the cost goes like this. Each instance is double the hardware of the next one. So if you put medium as default and you let your users run, it will spend four times the money of extra small in a period of 10 hours. And the difference is, of course, four times how much ever hardware you assigned. So if you make a fuck up and let's say do an XXL, which is the highest available for Excel now, it will spend you realistically 10 to $15,000 in a day comparing to extra small, which will spend you $50. So don't, Managing an XXL is if you are, I don't know, administering half of Facebook. So 
you never need for Excel, but if you make a wrong choice in the combo box, you can spend a lot of money. It's made for enormous data sets. Whatever you are using, extra small and small are usually sufficient. To the licensing story, these are the models. So most people will use standard. It comes with almost everything you need. When you go, so it has support, it has one day temp table. This is a functionality that you can tell, uh, get me the state of yesterday. So what Snowflake does, he automatically does also the backup. You don't do backups. You don't do a stores. You just tell him, give me yesterday's state. Uh, encryption, authentication, blah. So when you start going, and you will need, this is only one day. So this is for development, okay. But for production, you will need more of history, up to 90 days. If you need more, you either agree with Snowflake or you put it in the design. So for instance, you, you keep the, the, the it on a stay or you keep it in the landing zone. But technically, what they provide out of the box for backuping and live restore, because this takes like five minutes. You just say, give me the state of the table from yesterday or from two days ago, or put it in a new table and let me compare. And this is, for instance, a nice feature when you have a shitty data load, and then you can restore in a different table, a state from three days ago, and then you compare differences. And this is done with one line of command. Then if you increase the license, you will get data masking, you will get materialized views and so on and so on. And what on top of this you get from Snowflake? Micro partitions we will discuss. It's a technically very interesting topic to, to talk about. Timetable I already mentioned. Storage costs are not the biggest costs, but something to mention. Data caching, data sharing. So a lot, this is what we will discuss over the rest of the day. And now I want, and I, then I will do a five minute break to take a cup of coffee, is that if you can open a test account. Test account is, I use a spam one. I open a fake Gmail, you saw it, it's not, it's not a big deal. Um, and you basically click here, um, you can click Enterprise Edition, you will get 90 days. Uh, whatever you, you click, doesn't matter. Anyway, you will not see the cloud behind. Um, choose EU or whatever, and just go to your newly opened fake spam mail and access and choose a username and password. So this is how it looks. You put something in, then you choose the version. You can do whatever, Enterprise this. Um, put on some username password. Again, you will anyway not use it after the lecture. It's one time and you are signed up. And in your inbox, you will get an email with the link. And when you click this link, you will get um, this one. This is where you will log in. And this is where we start working. So when you open a, a, a temporary account, um, this is the interface you get. And this is where every ma all the magic happens. And when you do, you will be account admin, which is the highest administrative privilege in uh, Snowflake. Of course, normal users will not get this, but to demonstrate the features, you start as account admin. Um, I, will, I will make a break of five minutes because my voice needs a, a, a break. Um, I can maybe just go to this page. What do you get? You can get $400 worth of credit. In This was four months ago, the lecture. It's now 90 days, then it was 40 days. Um, but at the end, it's deleted. So whatever you do, you cannot back it up. There is a small period to do read only, but you cannot change it. 
but they will offer that you pay the money and convert. But since it's done on a fake mail, fake name, you will just forget about it. So now we start with the best practices, but before we start with the best practices, I will make now it's, uh, um, what is the time now? Il 1 11 until 1 16, five minutes just to get coffee. And then I will start with a little bit of GUI and then we go in advanced features. So let's get back together. If you have any topics, questions, complaints, please write them in the next five minutes. We continue at 1 16. Thank you. So, hello. I see I have one Q&A. That's something one. Ah, okay. So, Sejko, if you are still here. Okay. So, this is not <laughs> this is not a short answer. This is not a short uh, uh, question. Um I never used Gainplum. I know, of course, what it is. I never used it. Um, Google BigQuery. Google BigQuery is a different beast. Google BigQuery is, um, is a big data solution, which is, okay, um, let me do it differently. Uh, let me go to my slides for next maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then I will answer this question. Maybe you will get a better feeling. Um, the main difference, I, I would say it like this, the main difference is that you can do most of the things with every, every solution. Shift, BigQuery, uh, uh, even you can abuse databricks as a database, which is, which is not okay. Um, and to answer, if you see my mouse on PEM, What we do, you can do on PEM. You can do on SQL Server. You can do on Oracle. You can do on Postgre. You can do on, on Hadoop. But that's not the idea that Snowflake was made. You get all the minuses of on premise, which are hardware-based, which are licenses, which are upgrades. And at the end of the day, cloud might cost you more. And this is why I'm mentioning constantly cloud cost optimization. But you put from you so many things you have to do internally that companies are prepared to pay for it. And what I didn't mention, because then I'm not done in two hours, is a vendor lock topic. So Snowflake, comes with a huge amount of tools, which are Snowflake tools. It comes with, with, with uh, uh, data extraction tools. It comes with automated loading from buckets. It comes with data masking, on-the-fly data encryption, but they are, then you are in the vendor lock. And then you have to design it differently if you want to avoid vendor lock. So, I cannot do really everything in two hours. But uh, the second topic is if you want to do this or this, it, it's the speed of development. And this is for me the major difference. For a normal project where you consume data, you transform data, you put some DQ rules on top of it, I don't know, DBT, whatever you use today, everything will work. But the speed of how much data breaks and Snowflake as really leaders in data today are developing, you cannot compare. Yeah. So if you want a super fancy slide where I put Snowflake versus others with check boxes, I'm on purpose not doing this because then we go in a holistic debate and I want to avoid a holistic debate, right? But I will answer, this is a valid question, but let me first go to my slides. Um, and thank you for this question. I, by the way, it's a very important question. Uh, why is it important? Because at some moment you have to choose a platform. So, wait, give me a second here. I wanted to show something else. Just let me find it. Okay, I go to this, but I keep this one open. I will answer this one in more detail. Um, so if everybody is back, uh, 
still 21 minus our note taker, so 20. You didn't all escape. Um, we now go into more advanced features. And advanced features, you can find in other databases. That's, that's not uh, some of them. But not all of them this nicely implemented. So I have to go on click. And again, I'm trying to constantly avoid the topic of uh, vendor lock. But the fact is, we always use, if you are going to cloud or on premise, some kind of orchestration tool. Airflow is or was a standard. I like Prefect, I'm yeah, using it. But you need something to go to the ingestion part. Then you use uh, uh, DBT. My DBT, everybody likes Python, you have, it's configurable, you have a lot of libraries, blah, blah, blah. And then you do data visualization. So this is my first part, and I like to do this. Again, I am not a super fancy guy for slides, so I use usually the paint. So do you use Snowflake or yes or no? Depends on your choice. Do you like how the platform works? And it is the most modern platform. But if you are using a standard project, which will have data sources, which based on if it's cloud or if it's some files on, on premise, right? Uh, SSIS, Informatica, whatever. Can you do it with something else than Snowflake? Of course you can. But again, I'm not marketing Snowflake. I'm just giving a Snowflake lecture here. So if you are going some visualization here, will you choose Power BI? Will you choose Looker? Will you choose Tableau? I don't care. This is an architecture lecture and we are doing black boxes. If it's a vendor versus vendor, so God forbid you don't use Hadoop, but let's say that you use Hadoop or BigQuery. Will BigQuery work? Of course it will work. It will work until it doesn't, until there is a feature that it doesn't, right? So why, why am I forcing the big query? Because it's a popular solution. Yeah? And I try to avoid things like Vertica because it's a vendor lock thing, right? Um, so the question is, uh, 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 Let's say BigQuery is something which is more defined. It took more focus on security, right? So I don't know if how many of you uh, use BigQuery, um, but let's say, um, first of all, let's do the cost part. If you ever did BigQuery, you know that uh, both of them are actually quite cheap, Snowflake and BigQuery. Um, for the volume of data, I don't know exactly the price and the pricing is uh, negotiable by contact, right? Uh, but we are talking around 30 to $40 per terabyte per month. You have to put all of this in a calculation. For the security concept, BigQuery will also do schemas, views, procedures, but, uh, 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 until recently, Snowflake didn't do columns. Now it does columns. Uh, what BigQuery does, I'm just talking now differences, um, you can do data sets, but not, at least not before when I used it, it couldn't do tables or views. So which one do I use is basically I tie them all, but my primary or edge shift. Let's do edge shift. Uh, same story. Let's do, let's say why not edge shift versus Snowflake. Um, if you have files, let's say JSON or Parquet, and you want to store them on an Azure or on CLOBS or on, on AWS on, on, on ST, Snowflake has amazing support to parse files, right? And it has really cool integration of JSON parsing comparing to, to, to Redshift. Um, scaling of Redshift, I'm trying to answer the question. Scaling of Redshift. 
um, to, to, to increase the instances of H shift, when I used it, it took minutes. To, in, to increase hardware, it took minutes. In Snowflake, these are seconds. So, but on the other hand, the Snowflake on higher instances might cost more. So I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I have an answer to use the best what, you, what, what fits, right? I don't know if this is a good answer, but I'm just trying out of the head to think about options. And I'm approaching this again as an architect, not a vendor fan. What Snowflake brought to the market and how fast it is developing, I would advise that you at least take a look on it, even if you have something else. How you define a modern environment, you usually have to do things like orchestration, transformation, a poetic. And what is your job is to make it database independent. Because some things are really cool in Snowflake, like Snowpipe, which is a data ingestion tool, and it works really good. But then you are forcing yourself to do data ingestion with Snowflake. And maybe tomorrow you really have a good reason to move to something else. Or you use DBT, which is then orchestrated here. So think as an architect, not as a fanboy. Second topic is development versus production, security and business use cases. So development will always work. Development will work on any platform you put because you have a small data set, you don't have a lot of users. How do you maintain your stuff on production? So then let's let's do it more uh, 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 snowflake, let's say versus edge shift when edge shift is, is marked as a question. Um, to, to, work, to define things on edge shift takes a lot more effort than on snowflake. It will work in both cases, but if you ever did edge shift, it takes much more hands on. Snowflake is more setup based. But sometimes you cannot do the, 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 the level of configuration you would want on HF. Then you use HF. So it's again a compromise. Um, but HF versus Snowflake, both visualization tools or DBT, they will all work perfectly, right? So this is exactly the answer to the question. You, 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 you analyze pros and cons. Now we have a chapter which is not Snowflake related. It is one area where nobody does it on the lectures and it's not database related, but it's heavily Snowflake connected. Is how to organize things that things don't go wrong. So when you get a Snowflake account, you open your beautiful demo. And you get a GUI where you start empty. This is the GUI you got. And when you click data, you will get some sample database. And I will go to this slowly and I'm just fast clicking. And you will get some kind of dummy tables. You can even drop this database. This is just a sample one. Plus you will get one which is a system database, which you do not drop, where you have a lot of views where you, which you can use for your own reporting. So it's like system views and you don't drop this one or your account will not work. Only account admin can drop things on Snowflake. Some other users can aid only. So account admin is like your major boss of the instance. But then what happens next? You have to prove your use case. You have to prove that actually what you will deliver will bring some kind of value. And now I'm talking general data engineering. How do you define things? And then we will connect it to Snowflake. How do you find layers of things? And this is a traditional way of how things are designed. 
you load something from a data source, you do initial cleanup, I don't know, data types check or something. You do development of the, let's call it data mat. Maybe you need an intermediate in between if it's very complex and you have production database and maybe some reporting blocks either in schemas or specific databases. Each of these things are handled differently by configuration, by hardware resources, by users that can access them. Let's call them base. Let's call them raw. Let's say that you use dbt because dbt is usually what most teams use. On raw, this will be physical tables. When you can be physical tables, you will have partitions, which will, in case of Snowflake, will be done automatically in some, some other systems. In the base, you can already use views. So there's a different design concept from architecture things, how you define row and base. On row, you want full history. Because in, in, in one month, somebody might ask you that they made a mistake and they need to reload from seven days ago. You need history. This means that you need to uh, uh, give to this instance a lot of disk, but very low processing compute. Because there is not, no compute, there is no calculations going here. And one of the biggest mistakes is that people try to increase the speed of load by adding here, for instance, L instance, because they say, okay, then for my S3 buckets, if you are on RS, data will come faster. No, data will not come faster. You will just spend money on compute, for, which is for nothing. On the other hand, if we go forward, this can be views or tables, depends on your decision. Here will already usually be at least materialized views. And here for sure will be tables because probably the volume of data is too big. Where you put views or tables depends on dbt materialization, but it's your key architecture decision when you want to do, when to want to use a cloud database, because it's money. If you materialize to tables, you will pay more cost. If you materialize to views, you will pay more compute. And maybe you will need to increase the instance of compute from small to medium. But if you don't need history, on the other hand, you might use views. So I will not go deeper into the topic. I left links if you want to read about this. But if you are, let's say, on a reporting level, you don't want to see the sausages that an average analyst does. And the SQL sausage they can produce, which can be 500 plus lines of SQL, or it is generated by the tool where somebody clicked 20 filters, are very long one-off queries. And there are maybe, I don't know, experimentation, reporting, whatever. You have to be very careful on which compute instance you give your business user the privileges. Because if you give them Excel, they will write, they will, they will kill your money. And depends who pays for it, maybe their department if you are playing corporate, but I'm telling you these queries can be optimized. So compute, tables, views. Schemas. Let's say you are doing, sorry, Let's say you are doing, so this was compute. This was discussion on compute. Now this discussion on how to design schemas, whatever this is, sugar CRM, SAP, SAS, uh, I don't know, your beautiful transaction system. In the O, schemas should be named by the source because on each schema, you might apply different rules. For instance, for, for, for Facebook or Google, you will get a lot of quite simple data sets or Bing. 
But if you have binary stuff or JSON stuff, then it might be a little bit different. And you can define rules who cannot just access, but which resources he should use per schema. How you define, again, put in your head between raw and base. So if I go back not to, uh, not to talk, here is raw, here is base. This is already type safe. This should be, there should be some data quality here. This is how it looks um, then forward. So this comes with the schema. It's out of the box. This is the system views, and then you do something else. And I will not go to these slides. I kept them on purpose if you want to read again, because I will otherwise I will kill this lecture. But I want them that you read to them at least once. And I have from 27 to 32 a best practices on how to organize your project and read to them. At least once, if you are an architect, read to them. I will not now go slide by slide, but read to them not to make the usual mistakes. And these are all these beautiful recommendations. So this is your reading material after the class. Um, what I will go to is roles and users. And this is not the usual, of course, everybody here in this lecture knows what are roles and users. And it's not just about data integrity or, or, or this, it's about cost again, because, and it's about data masking. It, it's about security. The worst thing can happen is if you start assigning your users to the schemas or to the tables directly. And then in, 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 if you have hundreds of them, then you are in hell. Define a set of roles, assign roles to compute resources, and assign users to roles. Never assign directly to tables. And then there is a little bit of GUI, but I will now go to GUI again. This is for you materials. And grants, again, I'm giving you much more than, than I'm lecturing just because I want you to read about it. Um, Stoneflake implements the usual grant evoke concept, um, but there is another one which is called monitor. And this is for your supervisor of the schema or database instance, which allows you to monitor, but do nothing with it. So if you have somebody who needs to do a reporting, let's say how many people use something, then you grant him the monitor one. Yeah? So this is, this is the, this one. Again, read when you have time about how it works in the background. Now, before I go into the features, let's take a look on the GUI and let's click to it a little bit. Uh, if you don't like the GUI, dbware also works. Yeah, but then you cannot use most of the advanced features. But if you like it for development to add select statements or something, use this one. Um, how does it look in the GUI? When you start, Again, I'm going back to this one. This is how you start. It's fully empty. There is nothing you can, you have no database, no custom data, it's a clean account. So if we ignore help and support, I will just start a little bit of development. So let's say I have no tables. I have no databases. I got this sample data one and, and I have nothing. So I will create a new worksheet. There is a plus line. I will write in SQL. You will see that I have almost nothing. And each worksheet will get a name, which I can rename to my test worksheet, which is only visible under my account. And then I have my test worksheet. It's saved and it's saved there forever until you delete it. I will click on it and then you are back to it. And I will now create just 
to play a little bit, KA database test. And I can create a database, so control enter or this little sign, because I'm account admin and I put a refresh and now test is here and it's empty. It has information schema, which is views about metadata of the database, like in some other databases. And it has a public schema, which you can drop. It's just to play around. So this is the concept, but I will not show you development. This you can do for yourself. I want to now show you options. So development is usual. Development is, you know, uh, create schema, playground, you get a schema, you do some refresh, schema is here, and then you choose your, your test, right? And I want a schema playground, and then you create tables and stuff. So the usual abuse. So the usual approach. But this is an architecture level. This is not a SQL course. So let's go to what you can do with the uh, environment. When you click admin, you are now account admin. This is the highest privilege. This is the system administrator. Org admin is a little bit different. It has less resources, but it can administer everything on your organization level, which means users, groups, roles, privileges, encryption, data masking, all of this. But it cannot, for instance, close the account. Account admin, you see the GUI changed. I see here the money. But if I go to the org admin, I don't see the money because only account admin can see finances. So you have a lot of roles already inside. And because I am, my Marco Perica is my fake account, but not more than one person, or at least let's say two, to have a backup should have account admin. Because if he closes the account, which is my account, and I can theoretically close it, I think, Snowflake gets like 24 hours of restore and then I'll feed the same. So you don't want to give people this privilege who are not trusted. You, if it, they close it, you have still 24, 48 hours to request Snowflake for the return. But it, the, this window doesn't last forever. Uh, this is usage because I didn't use it. I basically spent no money. Creating one database is not money. So now we go to cost. To cost, I have extra small instance. Sorry, I have extra small instance, which is called Compute Veha. And at the moment it's disabled because I'm not running any queries. And I created it as a countdown with one user with two granted roles. And if I want to see what is inside, and here is the cost of the things when you earn it. It's measured in credits, and each credit depends on your contact. So contact with Snowflake defines your price of credit. How much it is depends on your dealings with Snowflake. There is no list price. There is a bulk price. It's between in the when when I saw it last time, it can really vary from three to six, from maybe even lower than three to higher than six. It depends how you agree with Snowflake. But let's say average one, let's put four dollars per hour, but this is only when there is activity. So let's say that normally, and I'm not, I'm also talking about, of course, jobs, not just people writing ad hoc, but an estimated cost, but you can, of course, you need a more precise measurement of money here. But let's say that in during development, your five to 10 developers are using just a small instance. And let's say they're using 10 hours per day all 10 of them, it will cost you something like this per day. And let's say they do development 20 days 
per month. This will cost you to use Snowflake for a team, for a small team. But this is doing development fine. And now when you go to production and you have some kind of a huge usage, it's usually because people leave a very long running stuff running and go home. And unless you define a cutoff that uh, usually it's 20 minutes. So if the query doesn't execute in 20 minutes, Snowflake will cut it in a timeout, mandatory timeout. And you cannot affect this. If you need something to run as an ad hoc one, not a job, job can run a long time, but I'm talking ad hoc, more than 20 minutes, then you probably have an issue either with select statement or with the resources available. But don't use instances as an optimization method because this really increases the cost. And each of these is four times the hardware. So I don't know, this one is eight gig, this is already 32 gig, and these are terabytes, but you see the increase in cost. So be mindful of which instance you are using and people who are not mindful have a cost explosion. And it's a real thing. So just because somebody pressures you, the, I need to have this in two hours, good. Usually it's eight hours. Will you accept the cost of additional four credits per hour by 20 hours by $5? And this is how you discuss in the cloud world. You want it faster, and unless we can optimize the technical part, you can get it. You will now go to large, and we will process it under large, but this will be our company's cost of 400. Because this is not what we use. We usually use this. And if you want to increase, you go to medium. You can even use some fancy features. And I will go to auto resume and auto explain. You put a save. And in about five to six seconds, it's already active. Now it's medium. It's still suspended. It's not spending money, but now it's medium. But when something would run, it would cost four credits per hour. Yeah. Auto resume and auto suspend and suspend after 10 minutes are key features. So let's say that there is no activity on the instance and you want to shut it down. Usually it's 10 minutes. And this is a good thing because otherwise it would run in the night. And we had a problem once that somebody made this mistake and left it overnight for 10 hours. 10 hours by five credits by 256, this is amount of money we just paid to Snowflake for nothing, for one night of wrongly configured sizing. It's gone. They take it from you. You cannot say, I'm sorry. So sizing, and this is why account admin should be a responsible one person who is really not giving to everybody this privilege. This is the main way how you manage money. So I didn't click, you, you click on this one and then you get some fancy graphs and activities of how many loads. You see that I did something here. You, you see, I did some schema, some tests, you get, you get some statistics. And if I would be spending money, I would have some cost here. So you, you, you can do reports and la la la. Yeah. So this is basics, but you can get a lot more from the system views. ASOS monitors are, of course, like in any other uh, uh, database, you can, but this is cloud, you can put my monitor and then you define, I'm allowing for this cycle on the level of either account, which is me, my cooperator, so entire, or a specific warehouse. In this case, I have one, which is compute, to spend 250 credits. And in that case, specify an action, suspend database to all users or notify. And I want to suspend when 
is used, and I say I create a source monitor. And this is also one way how you manage cost. So when the cost reaches 75% of this, make me an alert, which can be on Slack or email or whatever, and suspend the account until I approve, why the hell did you spend so much money this month? Use as an old app. Well, the standard, I will not go into this. You did it a hundred times. Security is security. You define network policies. So you define who can access if you want it like this, not just username, password, but you block certain IPs. Then there is billing. I'm not doing any billing, but if I would, I would need to define a payment method with a credit card. Now I'm in trial. These are contacts, these are accounts. And this is more or less what you have from the administrations. So my this, I can add a user, I'm this guy, and my only privilege is I own everything. And that's about it. No backups, no restores, no clusters, nothing. You manage users, costs, warehouses, roles, and ASOS monitors. Activity, I will not go in details, is just query, copy, task history. Queries, what did I do? I made a syntax error here. What did I copy? I didn't copy anything from any bucket, so nothing came in. And I have no tasks. Marketplace, I'm going quite quickly through this, but yeah. Uh, Snowflake has a marketplace, you can sell or buy data. On the marketplace, there is a lot of free stuff. COVID was popular, census, global climate change. I want, I don't know, everybody likes COVID. So I will do COVID, I click get, it's for free, and I click get. And at some moment, done. If I would go to data, I will now find my beautiful COVID, COVID uh, uh, epidemiological data, which has something inside. So this is the marketplace. You can buy it for free or you can pay for it. Of course, there is much more payment stuff. So for instance, financial data, it's free to try and it's paid and then you pay. So this is the market. And you can put your own data also for free or you want money. So maybe somebody buys your data. So they have the entire concept of marketplace. Data is databases, which we saw, nothing really special. And then we go to sharing, which I will go with you very detailed. And just want to go to everything. This is a provider studio. So here you publish your data to the marketplace. Here you can say, I want this database, this schema going to marketplace for $10. So you can sell your data. And there's a huge topic of governance here. I will not even touch because we don't have time but it has an entire module on data governance. How many tables were used in select statements, which have access, which are tagged, which blah, blah, blah. I don't have time to go to entire governance. It's now in preview and it's not to be used on production yet. But this is the, the, the way how Snowflake develops. He usually gives you stuff in preview at least one to two months before production for account admins or, yeah. So you can play it. Private sharing. Private sharing is a concept where you share with other accounts. So your friend has a account and you want to give him some data. He has a different Snowflake account. You share. I want to share my Snowflake account usage I have nothing to share because I don't have any data, but I can share to marketplace or I can share to specified consumer. And then again, I cannot do it because I'm on trial, but I could here enter the, your name. You are Anna. I know the login of Anna and I go and give Anna my data set if she accepts it. So the first question now, usually when you do the sharing and everybody asks it, who pays for it? Because it's always about money. Because you are sharing data, 
you are sharing data, but somebody needs to pay the cost because there is compute in the select statements they will do. And, 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 and it's shared. This cost is shared. So you are paying for the storage because it's still on your machine, but they are paying with their account on compute because they are executing the select statements on this data. And shared data is read on, of course. So if you make a separate schema where you dump your data for sharing, you will pay the cost of storage, but the one you gave the data will pay the cost of compute and compute is 90 plus percent of cost. So the fact that you are sharing doesn't mean that you have to pay for it, right? You pay a little bit, but yeah. That's the concept of the marketplace. So you can share to other users or you can, or you can give it to the marketplace. Dashboards are usually a porting place. I click a dashboard, give it some fancy name, and I start playing with tiles. I want to see from COVID something, Apple mobility, and then I start playing. I'm not using this functionality because of course it's much more beautiful to do in Power BI or Tableau. But if you want something really quick, if you want something really nice and done fast, you can. You just put some select statement and there is a report. But this is, I think, the least used version of Snowflake because yeah, it's not a reporting tool. And the worksheets. So we are back to let's do develop. And from the GUI perspective, that's it. So entire Snowflake, I'm not talking about now features, but entire Snowflake is this. You see nothing else. Even as a super admin, this is what you see. Yes, there's a lot of functionalities we will now cover in the last half an hour, but from the GUI perspective, and if you are not, let's, I will degrade myself now to a sysadmin, if the, it allows me, yes. So as a sysadmin, you see, I see no warehouses, I see no usage, I see zero users, so I'm now a sysadmin. This is just developer admin. And there is this very clear, of course, you can create your own roles, but I'm just using the included ones. And if I'm public, which means somebody just gave me a public one, I can do absolutely nothing. Okay, I saw monitor, but no user management, no nothing. So what your end user see is very little. It's all done in the background. And what is done in the background? is first of all, virtual warehouses. And now I will switch between windows to make it a little bit more appealing. I will go back to account admin and I will go to warehouses and I will create a new warehouse and I will call it my reporting processor, right? And I will give it small because I've already even medium. I want to give reporting guys a little bit more space. And this is a dangerous option to choose unless you know what you are using. Scale computer resources as query needs change. So somebody writes a shitty query and you will get automated in case during the query execution, just during the query execution, that it performs better, but you will pay for it. So to do this, you really need to trust the person or the persons who will be part of this role, which has assigned this warehouse. And of course you can do it like min max, but still you don't then control compute. Let's say I don't want to give you this, even if it's small, I can give you this, I create a warehouse and now I have my reporting process. And if I go back to my PowerPoint slides, I'm writing this on a beautiful slide so you can aid afterwards. They can be started, they can be stopped and they can be deleted. So each warehouse can be dropped, suspended or dropped or edited at any moment. Um, what's the price? It's always about price, right? 
Um, sorry. Um, this is the price, right? And 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 each of them is by double, almost by double. Yeah. And this looks small, but it multiplies. So be careful. Usually you do between small and medium. This is the usual one. Um, here are best practices, and these are the impacts. And I will not go through this because I have other important topics. But if if you want to eat, Snowflake made it for dummies. And even if you don't use Snowflake, I really like this 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 documentation, which is completely public, where you can learn a lot of how you should design things. Because even if you use something else, Google, BigQuery, what did you mention, Nightshift, you will still use ST buckets. You will still use parquet. And these are the best practices. So you can you can read a little bit about it. Um, these are the topics. Auto suspension and auto assumption always enable. Because if you don't, what what usually happens, somebody executes the query and goes home. But it keeps adding. So you get a full night of cost. This is why all the warehouses by default have it enabled. Auto resume and auto suspend. Concurrency. This depends on your compute and it's done in the background. If the warehouse which you assigned, which is let's say small, does not have a remaining resources, it's queued. Unless you allowed it to go, unless you allowed it to go, but this is not too wise, right? But otherwise it goes in the queue. The volume of queries in the queue is Snowflake defined, you cannot change it, but it, you have a delay. So again, if the queue does not come to processing in 10 to 15 minutes, it will be dropped and you will get an error message, insufficient resources. And this will know this will mean that you probably made a mistake, right? In sizing. I will not go through this, guys. This is an internal, beautifully written um, data sharing story. This is account to account or a data exchange. And I'm really sad that I cannot do this with you. But this is why I'm leaving your links. This is caching. And each database has caching. From the history of databases, we had caching. But how they did it is really cool. And technically, how they did it is really cool. And I don't know if you ever did caching in the world, or you just ran a query and didn't care. But it has cold warm hot concept, which means was the instance turned on off. So warm means it's in suspend, hot means it's running, cold means it's shut down. So starting a new virtual world. So again, this is deep architecture discussion. But if you are interested in the concept of caching, it goes more to query optimization than to, to, to cost. Here is the article, right? Um, data sharing. Data sharing is one of the key features of Snowflake. Um, you can share tables, views, materialized views, UDFs. And everything which you share is aid only. So the other guy to which you gave the data access to, he cannot change it. He can just do select statements, which is logical otherwise he can make a mess especially for the things you are selling publicly of course you don't want to give anybody from public ability to change your data um again i have a lot of slides here i think it's like five of them yes 
uh, and I made the entire architecture of how data sharing works. And if you are interested in how, here is the material. And but this for you as maybe one day developers will be the each sentence. Consumer is charged for compute. So what he does with your data, you do not care. You just if you copied your data just for him, you pay this small fraction of storage costs. But compute is on the guy who is using it, so he cannot pump your costs. And now there is a little bit of technical stuff which you want to aid if you want. And it goes to the concept of shares. So you define an object like a table or view or a database or schema. It's called a share. Snowflake calls it a share. And from the syntax perspective, it's basically create share. So it's an object, it's a full object on which you can assign roles and security and privileges. And you say, how do you share? What do you share, right? And then you give access to your other users to this share. So it's an object and you define security on top of it. And inside the share, and if you want to see syntax, you can. I don't have, because now you have to do some system things, but the keyword is on. And then you put, I don't know, we have our beautiful COVID thing or test dot playground dot something. And then you will create a share. And the, then the object will appear here and you will define security. I don't have syntax in hand. This is why I'm not, I'm always using Google for this because it's too much to remember. But let's say that you want to create a share. It's basically quite trivial. Create okay, share, say less. And then you define it on, on the level, uh, which tables, which views and something. And documentation is quite cool here. So you can define it at account level or a tag. And it's not a lot. Snowflake is made for simplicity. The point here is that to the share, you either add or remove accounts or put other restrictions. For instance, uh, you don't want anyone from standard license to connect to your enterprise on a public marketplace. Why? Because you have exclusive data and you don't want somebody who just opened the trial edition to consume your fancy data and you gave it for free. So you can play around with this a little bit. This is sharing. And here you have entire architecture. Again, I will not go because I have other topics. Um, if you want to share to a third person, this is not Snowflake. This is not Marketplace. You want to share to your friend, Philip. You can, and he doesn't have to have Snowflake account, but be careful. You, you open him a username and password, and that's it. He connects to your endpoint as an API, but then you, you, you do the cost because there is no other account to charge it to. So whatever he does with your data, you will also take a compute because there is nobody else to, to pay for it. So if you want to become a data provider, and this is what sharing allows you to, your account will, your, your, will take the cost. So if you are selling to somebody, make sure that he pays for whatever he's doing or you pay for it, if you're nice. Again, monitoring. And again, I don't want to use the dashboards of Snowflake. Tableau and Power BI made, because Snowflake is cool, entire dashboards for you, whatever reporting, tool you use, let's say Power BI or Tableau, I left you links for both. And they made it, this, this guy is from Microsoft, by the way, no, no longer, he was before. Uh, 
you have entire dashboard with all the code inside for free. So don't use the one, you have a really nice one, you can see how much you are using by instance, by number of credits. So if you are using these two usual reporting tools, just go to the page and you have everything, you have docs, you have basically one big download here somewhere. It's a, 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 a yeah, it's here. So you download it, yeah, it's a GitHub. So this is reporting if you want to monitor the instance. And I have, as you can see, not many slides, which brings us to the end of the lecture. I want to show you the elastics, and then we are done. I want to show you concept of timetable, which is very unique to Snowflake. I want to show you concept of failsafe, and I want to show you the micro partitions I said so many times, and then we are done. Timetable. Timetable, I really wanted this feature in my, 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 my life, allows you to, to go on a level of a table or a materialized view. If you fucked up, you dropped something, you, you, you wanted to roll back. And all you have to do, if your account allows it, is to do this. I want my table from five days ago, or in this case, five hours ago, this is 60 minutes. Or I want the state of my table on Monday 26th at this moment. You execute it. So I don't have any data, but let, let me try to execute it because I have an enterprise edition. It might work. It will just give nothing back because I didn't change anything, but maybe it works. And I have this COVID thing, right? So I will do something from, no, sorry. Good, and I have something from public and I have something from Apple Mobility whatever is Apple mobility beds. And I have some data inside. Um, and let me see if I can do it five hours ago. It's the same data. I didn't change anything and I just loaded it. So it's the same data, but if it would not be, this would be the historical snapshot of five hours ago. So this is how the timetable works. And it can be also a view. And I, again, I put your full description of how it works if you want to read about it. But your main account admin guy, so this guy, me, can define how long is this period. And it's defined on your license. If you're enterprise, it's 90 days. If you're standard, it's one day. But this feature saves your ass if you fuck up something, especially if you drop something. So in Snowflake, there is a famous function, which I also always wanted. You have a drop, but now you have undrop. And undrop works with, with time time. So you can undrop a drop, <laughs> which is usually not allowed in standard databases. When you drop, it's done. You have to go to backup. So this is timetable. You can clone, you have to do so aid if you're interested. Failsafe is for enterprise or business critical accounts is a when you have a failure. Let's say you made a really huge fuck up. You load the data double, you processed, you, you even dropped the entire warehouse because you made a mistake, right? There is a failsafe concept, which you cannot configure. You have to call Snowflake on your support. And if you are out of time travel period, you have another seven days, but they are not guaranteeing it. They do it, but they're not guaranteeing it. And if you read the contact, it's best effort. So after your time period is gone, time table period is gone, you have another seven days that they will do a restore. 
but they are not guaranteeing it as a service. And this you pay. And I, I never had to do it, but you pay a lot of money, actually, yeah. But this is like emergency fail safe when, when everything goes to shit. And the last, maybe the last slides is micro partitions. So again, I left you a lot of text and I will not go to all of these texts, but I want, sorry, I want just this block. When we did all databases, we always had to fight with partitions. How, how are we loading data? Daily, weekly, monthly, in the night, not in the night. It doesn't exist in Snowflake. It's done automatically. And this is why we have this metadata layer in the cloud. He stores, you don't pay for it. You don't even see it. He stores gigabytes of metadata. And he calculates an enormous amount of metadata about your data, averages, ages, data types, everything. And he has a learning engine in behind, which is creating on his own decision, you cannot affect this, 50 to 500 megabytes partitions, but in uncompressed. In Snowflake, it's smaller because all data is compressed. And groups of those are mapped into micro partitions in, of course, columnar fashion. And now you can consider that 50 meg is nothing because if you load a couple of terabytes per day or gigabytes or whatever sizes you are dealing with, you will have on a normal huge table, which we are discussing 700, 800 million rows, you will have between 100,000 and 1 million micro partitions, which when we designed stuff 10 years ago was a big no, because then partitions are slowing down your what? Update queries or delete queries or insert queries. But in general, this is not longer the case because creation of micro partitions is done as part of the engine. And all of that magic we used to do, let's disable indexes, then let's load the data, let's say calculate indexes, the new generations will not ever see. It's done in the background. If we don't have indexes, and then I put you some text and you have some more stuff, you also cannot have foreign keys because foreign key and primary key is what? An index. So Snowflake doesn't know anything about primary keys. Doesn't know anything about foreign keys. It doesn't know anything about unique keys. Joins are done by matching values, not by adding indexes. There are no indexes. The only constraint is null. There is no other constraint on Snowflake. So if you want data quality to check primary to foreign keys, you have to do it as part of your loading process, usually in DBT with tests. But Snowflake itself doesn't support indexes. It has them in the background, but not custom defined. There are no primary keys, no foreign keys, no, no nothing. Only not, you can, the only thing enforced is not null and not null. And this brings me to the end. And I just want to say what I didn't say. And I didn't say a lot. And what didn't I say? Because again, I need a whole day for this. You go to the docs, not these docs, uh, docs snowflake com. And then you can see what I didn't say. I almost didn't touch security because I didn't have time. This would take me entire two hours, but you have entire story of encryption. It's fully compatible with all the standards. Data is never stored unencrypted, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, cost, I just showed you that you can make a report, but I will maybe spend one more minute on the cost. I didn't show you uh, loading from ST buckets. So let's say you have an ST and I don't have time for this because it's again, it's not just an, and this is an architecture one, not a development one. And again, it's done to stages and stuff. And this is why I want to show you Docs Google, the uh, Docs Snowflake com. What I did with you, I showed you virtual warehouses. I show you a little bit about databases, but I didn't show you how to create views, this you know. I didn't show you loading from various clouds because then it's again development, but here you have entire code available. What I did show you, or I didn't show you staming. I didn't show you Kafka because then it would again take forever. What I did show you is data sharing. I showed you alerting. I showed you a little bit about security. I showed you everything there is about organization account management. And I showed you business continuity, meaning fail safe and data table. And I showed you cost. And here, if you want in detail, you can do a lot of cost exploration. And how do you, and this is really the last thing, but it's important. How do you do cost? On the level of databases, there is a Snowflake database. This is a system one, and it has system views like most standard databases we work with. There is one which is called account usage and it has views. And here you have everything. And then you build your custom views, which are also granted, which histories we did, which copies from buckets we did, uh, how much money we spent Okay, in credits, it's always in credits. Meeting daily history. How much did we bill? How much we used? So everything is here. You just need to create your beautiful custom report or use the Tableau one. I don't have a lot because as you can see, I used uh, 0.08. So if you want by money while I was doing your demonstration and it's a trial account, so I spent money, but I spent with you, let's say it's $4, I spent, 30, zero, 30, zero, zero, 35 cents. But you need a report when you start really using it. That's it for me. Uh, I have five more minutes. Any questions for those who survived? Was it good? Did you all fall asleep? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Any kind of feedback is good. <laughs> because I don't see you guys. You, you know, it's, this is not a, a room. You are just on the screen. Is it was it okay? Do you have any questions? So we are done. I have 17 live attendees. Anybody still wants to ask something? Okay. If you have questions or want to do something with Snowflake or have questions, my email um, very easily found on LinkedIn. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure. Tomorrow it's on site. If anybody wants coffee, I have a lecture on a completely different topic on toxic management. So I'm talking managerial tomorrow. But if you want Snowflake, find me on, on, on in Hippo Center, however it's called now. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and thank you for this wonderful presentation and a wonderful tutorial. Uh, since nobody has no questions. We're I killed them all. I destroyed them. <laughs> no, they're all dead. I'm still, here. I'm still here two hours later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're uh, all dead. Thank you. Once thank again. you all for coming. And have a nice day. See you later. Bye-bye.